getting any better do you see the anxiety written in his face he's not smiling and in fact if you saw the original picture you would see his eyes are li literally like i don't trust this man and he's looking at ravindranath tagore okay this is a very different look from the look of devotional affection that tagore's face usually gets from us okay now this is the look that i found in the eyes of a fakir uh, about a hundred years later and this is the fakir i was telling you about the 108 year old well he died when he was 109 but i met him when he was 108 badar shah and you can see that his left eye the middle of the left eye is actually white uh, that but he can't see a thing perhaps his blindness allows him to see everything that's why now uh, keeping that in mind let's move on to a song by lalon where he talks about um, the social reality of being a farmer under a zamindari system uh, in which he is actually he starts the song with a very factual statement that my promissory note of debt mind has been seized by the company so what does that mean that he had loaned money from the british east india company's agent and he couldn't repay the debt therefore the note has been seized and the next step would be that he would be left landless the land would be taken from him uh, but see how lalon kind of ties that comment on the social system to his sadhana to his practice so i won't give you the next line let's get deep into the first two lines amar baki kaha do and suddenly uses that as a symbol to understand the enemies within the body as well so he connects the external reality with the internal reality now he keeps doing this in song after song after song after song you might think that you know he's talking about something secular or something you know independent something you know that had nothing to do with the social practice no sir no madam he doesn't do that there's a song for example he has on cholera believe it or not he has a song against cholera saying don't go jumping around in stagnated water the water will go down your mouth and you will die and then he describes in the second verse how you know time you know these amulets on your hand around your neck putting mantra into them 
and putting stones and everything. None of this is of any good. You need to have a scientific mind and think logically what's in that water. Now, that water is not holy. There's nothing called holy water. Only clean water is holy water. Okay? Now he's making that statement. Then in the last verse, he makes a turn around. What does he say? That, you know, our minds are like as, as restless as those people who want to go and jump in the water and play. You know, be careful or that other inner cholera will get you. So the cholera also ultimately is folded within this metaphor of the Monir Manush, of the man of the heart. Okay, so all songs basically go back to it. Uh, now, I will return to the theme of the bird and sing you another song on the bird, Pakhi. In Bangla we say Pakhi for bird. So this song is called Pakhi Kokun Jan Ure Jai. Now, Lalong wrote a lot of songs that were pretty plaintive and mournful and um, they were uh, about a life that he had led that failed. Lalun did not consider his sadhana to be successful. Um, maybe it was it was his humility that made him say, say so. I was having a talk, a chat with uh, Shanti Prasad uh, this morning and we were talking about how we often use humility to hide the the, the, the drama that plays out within us, yes, 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 tell me, tell me, I'm good, tell me, I'm good, tell me, I'm good, tell me, I'm good. And we, we said, no, 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 I'm nothing, I'm nothing. But Lalun, I believe, is actually trying to say that I'm nothing. There's a huge difference between that and social politeness, performance of social politeness. So, um, and that is reflected even in the melody of the song. So this one, friends, Bear with me, I'm going to sing the whole song. It's my favorite Lalan song. Please indulge. Pahe Kokhmo Jano Mm-hmm. 
and we often tend to uh, overlook that because we don't know that. And this is an excellent device because it allows Lalon to express something that is inexpressible. It allows him to sing and use that expression of musical expression to hide what he actually means and create a system of codes exactly like the dancer, uh, the, the mudras of a Kathakali dancer. If you don't know what those gestures mean, it will mean something general to you. But if you know what it means, you will be the Sarida Rasika, where you will understand what Rasa Nishpatti is happening through the, that Avinaya. So here let's stop for a second and take a caveat from the American anthropologist Hugh Urban, where he says, we must be far more modest in our claims regarding esoteric traditions, no matter where, and far more ready to admit that there is an awful lot we do not know and cannot say much about, and accept the extreme indeterminacy inherent in the very nature of something that is supposed to be secret. Um, I remember I once met uh, a, a uh, an 85-year-old fakir. He was one of my more, the, one of the fakirs that I respected the most. He died a couple of years ago in Allahi um, Who um, once told me? I asked him a question about the practice, and he was usually a very calm and tender, soft man, very soft-spoken. Um, his eyes always reflected a certain tranquility of heart, and. For a second he looked at me and I could for a nanosecond see anger in his eyes. And he just smiled quickly, he hid it and then said, you know my son, you are standing on the threshold to the room that is not yours. I have allowed you to do that, but no further. Stop. This is the furthest you can come. If you want to enter, you will have to enter the practice. You have to enter the practice. So, even despite all these years that I've spent, uh, you know, on Lalon, I feel like I know very little. Um, the more I know, the lesser it feels. You know, Tagore has a song which goes, "Noyon tumare pai me dekhi the, rojhu noyon noyon." The eyes cannot see you, but you reside in the eyes, inside the eyes. Ridoyo tumare pai na jani the, the heart cannot ever get to know you. That you are somewhere inside the heart itself. It's almost like, you know, we can see our body, right? You can see every part of your body. You know, but the one thing that always represents you, your face. Have you ever thought this? You'd never be able to see your face ever in your life. You'll see a reflection, but a reflection is an inversion, right? Right becomes left, left becomes right. So it's the opposite. So you re never really, you live an entire life without ever having met yourself. Ah, <laughs> Because it really puts you at the doorstep of the ultimate conundrum. Who are we? Where are we going? What is the meaning of this? How are we different from the ant that gets trampled? We were talking about that, Shanti Prasad, this morning. Little did I know that that conversation would figure so prominently in this lecture, but it is. I'm allowing it to. Um, all right. You know, one, another Pokir in, in, in Kushtia who I met, who, was, who I was very close to, once um, told me something I think that is very important. He said, Age Gan, Pore Gan. Gan is the Bengali word for Gyana. And Gaan is the word for Gana. So you see the similarity in the two words. He says Age. Those of you who know Hindi would understand. Age means before, ahead. At first, you need the Gyan. And then the Gaan can follow. Okay? In English, it's an unpoetic translation. No first, sing last. Probably that's the only way of saying it in, in, in as pithy a way. Uh, and it's by... Morum Pukir Kurim Shah, who received the highest national award, uh, the, the, the Bharat Ratna equivalent, Ekusha Podok in, in, um, in Bangladesh, and he had to sell it as gold in order to pay for his wife's treatment. 
So that's how the nation deals with its the very people it tries to respect. It didn't care about Lalun's image. What would it care for a poor, uh, struggling, starving Pukir? Anyway, so that's where we stand. Now I'll move to another song that I will sing in its entirety. We have had the bird, we have had the Monir Manush, we have had the fish. Now he also calls this Monir Manush the neighbor. I don't know whether Lalon saw the partition coming, you know, whether at one point Bengalis in West Bengal would have to look towards Bangladesh to find their neighbor there and vice versa. I don't know whether he saw that or not. But this song is about, I have not seen him even once, my neighbor, who lives in the city of mirrors near my house. Okay? So, uh, and in this song you'll find that I'm using different melodies for each of the verses. Now, Lalun songs are sung very dif differently uh, from region to region. And at times, you know, you fall in love with a certain melody and you don't care about is this the original Shuram Kushtia folk music or music that belongs to the oral tradition. You know, Lalon knew how to read and write and chose not to. And he would make up his songs by mouth, he never wrote them down. So those are in the oral tradition. So oral tradition has a certain uh, unfixity about it, a certain fluidity about it. Therefore, there is nothing called the original um, tune. So, I've picked up three different tunes from three different areas of Bengal, West Bengal and Bangladesh together and I'm trying to sing it with that in mind. Oh, she 
unfortunate creatures that we are, the humankind, the glorious humankind, we need this stupid blue document that has to have an equally stupid sticker-like document pasted in that will allow me to go inside. You know, and you go to the other side and as a Bengali, they, you know, on the other side, the border control sees the passport and looks at the visa, marks everything, everything is fine. And in a very accented Hindi says, Aap India se kobaya? And I would say, excuse me, I can speak Bengali. I'm Bengali. I may be from India, but I'm still Bengali. Nahi nahi, aap Indian hai. So suddenly, my identity as a Bengali is at question because of my passport. And to be honest with you, and this is the irony, I'll be completely honest. Uh, no, I don't stand up during Jalamana Gana uh, in, in cinema halls. Because I don't think that is how I can express my fidelity to the nation. If I love my country, I'd rather lie down on the ground and sing it. So the entirety of my body is touching my soil. Standing actually makes my contact minimal with the land. I won't sing Janaganamana with my hand held on my heart and then go outside and spit on the street. Or if you are a man, you would take out your penis and pee on a wall. If that is okay, then not standing up during Janaganamana is okay. Um, so, and the irony is, the guy who wrote Janaganamana Dhinayakar Jayahe Tagore also wrote the national anthem of Bangladesh. And to be honest with you, as I was saying, I have said to be honest with you three times now, uh, I am more comfortable in Dhaka than in Delhi. Okay, so that does that make, it, make me an anti-national? So help me God. Okay, move on. Now, unfortunately, this is what I need to do to get across that fence in order to get to Lalun's mausoleum. It says, Phokir Lalun Shah Jonmo Ogyato. Jonmo Ogyato means year of birth unknown. Mrittu, it states the date first in Bengali uh, and then in English, last line, 17th October 1890. Okay, now, this is fine. When I first went there in, in 1997, this plaque was not there, first of all. It was just a kind of a very rudimentary um, uh, concrete house where the bricks were still visible. And it was just a mound in the middle of the room, on one side of the room really. 
and and the, uh, the the guys that you saw on the on the video, Nizamuddin Fakir showed it to me and said that's where Shaiji is asleep. But when I went back in 2008, between 1997 and 2008, I couldn't go. Uh, I didn't have any monetary support to uh, conduct the research. So in 2008, when I finally went back to Bangladesh again, and since then I've been going almost every year, uh, multiple times. This is what they've done to the tomb. So what used to be the akhara or the retreat, you know, without any religious connotation, whatever, suddenly had turned into a mazar. Okay. Now, um, you know, it looks very much, it's modeled on the Nizamuddin Aliya mausoleum in, in Delhi. It's a, it's a miniature of that. That's the kind of architectural style that has been used. So the Akra is now a mazar and at night, a uh, sexy moonlight and all of these things make it look really cool. Uh, but in the morning, okay, this is at night. Okay. In the morning, it turns into this. And can you see that arm peeping out through the left hand side of the frame, a red bloused female hand? Uh, that's the mother. And this is the father taking the picture of the son. So it becomes a tourist site. It has been, it has been uh, Disneyfied completely. And the river, the little river by which Lalon Shah was rescued, that river itself has been filled up, landfilled and turned into guess what? Guess what? Make any wild guess, anybody? Across the Mazar, there's the river where Lalon Shah had swam over to be resuscitated by his Sufi parents. That river has been at least more than 60-70% of it has been landfilled and turned into whatever remains has turned into a little pond. And it has been landfilled for what? Any guesses, anybody? A parking lot. I'm not joking. A parking lot where tourists come, the buses stand there and wait while the tourists go and uh, you know watch Mickey Mouse Lalo. Okay? But the this is indeed something to be scared about. But what's more scary is the infiltration of this culture into the life of the Fakirs themselves. Um, here's a Fakir taking a selfie. I saw the same picture yesterday when I went to the backstage of the Kathakali performance that I went to see. The guy who was playing Lakshman was taking, uh, was you know, posting something on Facebook, sitting backstage, and a few moments later he was on stage having a conversation with Rama. So how are these realities reconciled? This is also uh, something that needs to be talked about. We cannot just simply stop at saying, oh, the olden days were so nice, no mobile, no. Well, the olden days are gone and the mobile and the digitalization is here to stay. Now what? That is the question that faces me as a researcher. How do we deal with it? I am trying my ways to, to deal with it, and, but this is not the subject of this lecture, so I won't digress. Uh, but instead, uh, let's return to Lalong's idea of situating himself between faiths. Okay? Um, there's a famous um, composer, poet that we had in, on the western side of the Bengal in the 18th and 19th centuries. His name was Ram Prasad Sen. Have any of you heard of his name, Ram Prasad Sen? He sang songs in praise of Kali and his, his music is called Shama Sangeet. Shama meaning Shama, the other name for Kali. So Shama Sangeet, songs in praise of Kali. So Lalun uses that melody, uses that melody to sing this song. Blessings of Mother Kali saying, Yeah, you can sing that to Mother Kali, Kali, but also sing it to teach yourself how to really do the namaz. So look at this, Kali and Mecca are combined. The Mecca within the body. Shri 
went to Kushtia in 97. This is how it looked like. Now, 11 years later, it had changed very dramatically. Let's see that change. This is now the venue for the state-supported institution, the Lalon Academy. That was until recently run democratically by a committee of elected life members, some of them belonging to the leading political parties of Bangladesh, striding both left and right, secular as well as the religious ideologues. These members came from the elite in Kushtia town who have all paid hefty sums to buy life memberships. They run the place, decide who is to be invited, organize Lalan festivals, work with government and international funding, arrange tourist performances, organize classes and workshops for children and youth, and in October every year, they also organize the big Lalan fair. Lalan dies through misunderstandings, political corruption, romantic and false elevations, embezzled funds, elitist takeovers, through the immense power of co-option, the printed text's conquest of Lalong's sun word, through making him a national icon, be it on a posted stamp or the brand logo of a mobile phone company. Now uh, this is the billboard in front of that parking lot that I was talking about. And it says Lalong Parking. It just says Lalong Parking. <laughs> And who's parked there? <laughs> Lalan parking. And then there's a very hefty charge sheet over there. You know, for, for buses, it's 200 taka. For micro bus, it's 50 taka. For car, it's written ka a ra. You know, not, in, not, not the Bangla word for it, but car. Car is 30 rupees. Motorcycle, it says motorcycle over there. Motorcycle is 10, 10 taka. Then CNG, CNG means auto rickshaw. Even auto rickshaw, people come in auto rickshaws there too. And those are for 10 rupees and bicycle is 5 rupees. And all of this goes to Lalon Academy at the bottom, it says so. Okay? Now, all of this adds up to a very disturbing and distressing conclusion. Thanks to the water distribution agreement between India and Bangladesh, the Gorai River, you know, is a trickle today. The Kali Nodi, where Lalon had been rescued, has been ha landfilled and turned into a parking lot by the Lalon Academy for all sorts of vehicles to accommodate the ever thronging tourists. The river is more, not much more than a trickle, not more than a pond today. Not only is it an ecological disaster, it is also a heritage catastrophe. The Lalon Academy has turned into an institution held dubious by the Pokies themselves. So this is a classic case of upper class and literate classes takeover of the subalterns. Okay, um, and here's you've seen. I've, I've talked about Badesh. I've shown you his picture. Now let's hear his voice. Just a few months before he died. I think he gives the best possible answer. <clears throat> Do you think that all this is an insult to Lalon? He says that's for Lalon to figure out. I'm not going to worry about it. So that is the ultimate defense mechanism. That come what may, if there's a storm blowing, I just duck and avoid the storm. I'm not going to try and fight the storm because it will kill me. So the pragmatic way is to duck, let the storm pass because the storm has no personal enmity with me. If I don't do anything to it, it won't hurt me. 
So run away, let the storm pass, and then be yourself again. So this is how the Baal faith has actually survived. You know. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, let's move on. What happened? Is it playing again? Why? Hello. Okay. Um, now Lalon talks about this as well. Um, the one song where he actually talks about the city bred people actually who are exploiting the urban people, this whole urban rural divide and relationship based on exploitation. Lalon talks about in his it in his song and then guess what he does? Guess what he does? He takes that exploitative relationship, that scheme of things and turns it into the exploitation that happens within the body, how calm, growth, and etc. like we were seeing with the other instance. Uh, but what's interesting here in this particular song, uh, he talks about the 16 pirates of the city inside his body. Now what's interesting is that for city we use in Bengali the word shohor. We don't use nagar, nagara, which is the Sanskrit word. We often use shahar, which is actually a Farsi word, shah, okay, for, for city. And then he uses sholojona bombete. Bombete is a word that derives from the Portuguese bombardiers. Armada, the, the pirates, not of the Caribbeans, of Portugal. Okay, so uh, he's using a Portuguese based word, he's using a Farsi word and he's writing it, putting it in a Bengali sentence. So he's actually not just talking about the British colonials, he's also referring to further back, to Portuguese colonization. Uh, oftentimes we forget that there's a big legacy of the Portuguese in Bengal. Most of the Bengali Christian population on both sides of the border have Portuguese last names, Gomez, Rosario, De Costa, De Souza. These are names that we find. So there's a whole history of Portuguese colonialism also that is overshadowed by the British colonial history. Uh, but Lalon is not unmindful of that. He remembers that as well. So, but the, but the enemies of the city, the 16 pirates of the city, why are they 16? We all know about the Shara, Shara Ripu, that there are, uh, you know, the other six Indriyas, the six senses, and then the ten further Ripus of the body. So together they turn it into 16. So, I will reveal the next verse when time comes, but enjoy this bit. <laughs> strategy, one discursive narrative. So who then was Lion is our big question. On the one hand, he was a spiritual practitioner, a sadhak, within a specific hermeneutic system and philosophy. Okay? It's a, it's a very prescribed, well-organized, it may be a mix of many influences, but what has emerged is a very organized system of practice. Um, 
we must understand his music as a manifestation of that practice as sadhan sangeet sadhan sangeet mystical devotional music not popular populist folk music meant merely for entertainment it's more than that um he created a system of spiritual as opposed to religious practice that united elements from different religions available to him into a syncretic or rather hybrid entity that was truly secular as opposed to tolerant remember we started the lecture with that um he looked for the creator within the created so that's an interesting thing because um even even other other bhakti movement uh, you know figures have said this like kavir says कहत कबीर विचारो सैन माही सैन मिली हाँ रंग महल में अजब शहर में आजारे हंसा भाई निर्गुण राजा में सिरगुण सी मिल जाए सेइंग दैट द यू नो द साइन रिजाइड्स विद इन द साइन द साइन द मैनिफेस्टेशन ऑफ गॉड दैट वी लुक आउटसाइड दैट साइन रिजाइड्स विद इन द साइन बिकॉज आई एम आल्सो साइन ऑफ गॉड्स क्रिएशन बट गॉड रिजाइड विद इन मी सो इट्स लाइक eternity within a transient entity so this is this is what he is positing okay um he inverted patriarchal misogyny by putting woman at the center of his practice and search for divinity this is another breakaway rebellious revolutionary step um he was a social commentator who link, linked his practice to the social conditions he lived in so it wasn't bereft of so as we know am i hallucinating okay no um uh, so who linked his practice to the social reality that he lived in okay um he was a political commentator who connected both his practice and social condition to larger historical and political contexts okay uh, all these we have covered i'm just summing up he was arguably a proto feminist revolutionary a feminist before the term feminism gets coined who worked surreptitiously with an egalitarian philosophy that had grown out of the soil of the land so what are the aims of the project man of the heart what uh, you know we have done we've been doing this production for 13 years now probably it's time to bring the curtains down on it i'm not getting any younger uh, you know performing for two and a half hours by myself on stage jumping and singing all these songs without a microphone is not an easy affair any longer so i think i'm going to stop it but then uh now i have to start working on a book but my biggest problem with the book idea is how do i textually produce that is unproducible as text lalon resisted textualization he resisted the written word so how do i use writing to do justice to that Unwritten, unwritten spoken word. So I don't know. I haven't yet solved that conundrum. The the, the struggle is ongoing, uh, but eventually it will be a research come practice project where practice will be just as important as the research. Um, research started in 1991. Field work in 1997. Performance began in 2005. Running for 13 years on the trot. Now, can performance and all of this to ask the big question. can performance serve as an index to written archive and field work so i missed the word serve my bad typo uh, can performance serve as an index to written archive and field work can it compensate can it add value to uh, what what the archive misses because the archive is always fragmentary the archive is always metonymic it tends to take the part for the whole but it is not the whole Uh, and it's a, the whole point of oral and field research uh, and visual and performative research is to kind of uh, complete the picture so how can that play in the world of textual academia uh, performance as a response to and record of orality so it needs to work as both uh, going beyond thick description that clifford gates the anthropologist has talked about Uh, he already started post-structuralist anthropology. Has already started the dismantling of objective anthropology and bringing subjectivity back into it. And performance actually brings the body of the anthropologist into in the center stage of the research project. So how do you deal with that? You have to go beyond thick description. 
subjectivity uh, that veers on on narrativity uh, from within, from the belly of the beautiful beast called Lauren Pukit. Um, propose a new, more organic model of secularism. Um, now we will end the performance. Uh, we will end the performance with just one song. It's, I think, a song on globalization and contemporary South Asia, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, whatever you take. Um, and it was composed more than a hundred years ago. Uh, he says, Bedvidhirpur Shastru Kana. And he locates himself in the Kanar Hadwaj. Oh dear, oh dear, can you, can you, can you take that for it? Sorry, sorry, just a few minutes. Bedevi dhir shastra